I'm happy to introduce Clayton Lewis, who is the CEO of Arivel, and Arivel was the startup of the year. I hope that you read the description. He is an Ironman triathlete, accomplished executive, a um, person that's very passionate about wellness, health. Um, he has like a really kind of rich career in this in in this space over the last couple of decades, right? I believe. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, what his company is doing, what his personal motivation behind the wellness is, what are the latest discoveries in the area, what are the tools and the data that his company is generating, and how is that influencing lives of his customers, of friends, family, community, and how it can influence the world uh, in the near future. Uh, so I would start with, you know, like, give a short, you know, deeper introspection of, of your motivation, of your successes so far, your failures, and we can go from there. Um, <clears throat> so for whatever reason, my whole life, I have been really passionate around health and wellness. And so I was raised in small towns in Wyoming and Idaho. Uh, and my sister shares a story that when she was six years old, everyone had a piece of birthday cake. And then all of a sudden, boom, the birthday cake was gone. And I threw it away. I'm like, OK, you've had your piece of sugar. Uh, and not that you need to be this crazy or possessed, which I'm not. But it's interesting to think about sort of what brings passion to each of you and what's most interesting. And so my very first business when I was in college, which was back in 1977 in Eastern Washington, was I opened a health bar. And so way before people were thinking about supplements and juicing, et cetera, I was just drawn to that. Then um, for about a decade, I worked in politics. And so I was one of the youngest chiefs of staffs in Congress and worked for a congresswoman who was the only microbiologist in Congress. This was sort of the theme weaves through. Then I did five startups uh, and took two of them public. And so was fortunate to partner with really extraordinary entrepreneurs and then help them scale their businesses very quickly. Then the, I went and did a startup in health and wellness, <clears throat> and it was backed by Mavron, which is a consumer-only venture capital firm founded by Howard Schultz. So then Howard and Dan Levitan asked me to join as a venture capitalist, and so for eight years I looked at health and wellness. And I walked away thinking, okay, this is a very tattered category. And I think the wellness category has failed for three reasons. So the first reason is people on the whole don't wake up and think, Today, I want to be healthy. You know, chocolate cake, risk of diabetes, tends to be a pretty clear choice. Uh, eat that cake. You know, <laughs> second, what's interesting, and especially you know this in your world, data actually paralyzes people. And so it's so interesting because consumers are spending millions of dollars. You know, how many people do you know have a Fitbit? They're trying to take 10,000 steps, and they have absolutely no idea where they're going because the data is not linked to something they care about. And then finally, uh, this may be heresy, but you know, a lot of young, brilliant entrepreneurs would come in and say, oh, it's all about the app or the shiny device. And we believe passionately at Aravel, you actually need a person in the relationship. So as a venture capitalist, um, we at Mavron target individuals we wanted back. And so a gentleman who's our co-founder, Dr. Lee Hood, was at the top of my list. And the reason is Lee is one of the first scientists that mapped the human genome. Uh, he's considered the father of systems biology. If you're a scientist, it's an extraordinary honor to be invited to join one of the National Academies of Science. Lee's one of 15 people in all three. But then wearing my venture capital hat, Lee's founded or co-founded 15 companies that today are valued at roughly 200 billion. So he's always launched companies into industries. And so I'd been courting Lee for about four years. And he said, Clayton, let's go have dinner. And I'm thinking, game on, I get to Backley Hood. And he said, OK, science and data is to a point where we can look at individuals as a system, look at their genomics, look at their blood, look at their gut microbiome, look at their saliva. And by taking this holistic view of individuals, we can actually help them optimize their wellness and more importantly, avoid transitions to disease in both the short term and for decades to come. And so he's sharing this vision with me. And he said, we're going to change the world. We're going to launch a brand new industry, which we're calling scientific wellness. And it's going to be the biggest company of my career. And he's the founder of Amgen. And he points to me and says, you're going to be the CEO. And so here I am. <laughs> OK. Uh... <laughs> 
Uh, by the way, you know, for full disclaimer, I'm, I'm you know, like one of the alpha customers of Arivel. Whenever the service was announced, I told to my wife, okay, I want to try this. Um, my background was also in, uh, you know, bioinformatics, so I was really kind of thrilled that you guys kind of started that and how the company is growing and providing kind of more features and users and so forth, right? So in that vein, can you explain more with the changes that you're facing in the field, kind of bootstrapping a new startup, uh, you know, like from ground zero, growing the operation, you know, can you mm-hmm. share a little bit more details about that? So when Lee came with this idea that it was all about the data, because of course Lee's a scientist, so he would think it was all about the data, and I shared sort of my view of what I'd learned in the, in the wellness category. And, and in addition to my work, I've also uh, been on the Harborview Medical Center board for 14 years. And so we're a trauma one hospital for 23% of the land mass in the United States. And we're also at the public hospital. So we do you know, about $100 million of charity care. We treat everyone exactly the same. The, the individuals that work at Harborview are extraordinary. I'm also on the board of the University of Washington Medical Center. And so, and when I first joined sort of doing volunteer work and governance work in healthcare, you know, I thought, okay, everyone should have access to healthcare. But of course, as you dive in, you learn it's not really healthcare, it's ill care. Because on the whole, in America, an average individual spends 17 minutes over the course of a year with their primary care physician, 17 minutes. So in that 17 minutes, they're basically gonna make sure you don't have any symptoms. And I have such respect for healthcare workers. I mean, clearly I'm on two boards. But those individuals are trained to treat problems. They're not treated, they're not designed or trained to optimize your current wellness. So when Lee came with this idea, I had been following another company in town where I was trying to recruit out the CEO to start another business called Free and Clear. And what I loved about Free and Clear is they had the most efficacious smoking sensation, behavior change, weight loss program in the country. And it was all about behavior change. And they had scaled to where they were onboarding. They'd gone from 40,000 individuals a year to 400,000. And about a year before, they'd been sold to Alira, so I raided the company. I got their chief translational science officer, their head of coaching, their chief business officer, even their uh, director of finance to come help us build this company. And we decided to do a test in 2014. And so basically, Lee and I recruited 108 of our friends. And we did what's called an Institutional Review Board Approved Study. And it looked a lot like this room. You know, people came, everyone thought they were healthy, all actively engaged in the healthcare system. And so we created this dense dynamic data cloud. So first, we did whole genome sequencing. And we try to be really clear, genes are not your destiny, but it gives us some really interesting insights into predispositions. So that's quadrant one. Quadrant two we looked at was clinical labs. And so when you get a typical physical, they're gonna look at about 30 different analytes. We look at north of 90, because it's these analytes that are a reflection of your life choices to date. Uh, then we take a saliva measurement, and we look at four different day part measurements of saliva, because that gives us insights into hormones, cortisol levels, are you really managing the stress? Look at gut microbiome. It's a nascent field, but in the context of a system, it's pretty fascinating. And so, and then of course, assign a coach, and the coaches are registered dietitians. So these 108 people, as they went through this journey, and I'll share my story, I was one of them, turned out 90% of them had meaningful nutritional deficiencies, meaning nutritional deficiencies impacting the health journey they were on. 70% over time were moving towards chronic disease states, and it doesn't mean on Wednesday you're gonna get diabetes, but look at heart health dimensions, diabetes, stress markers, optimal nutrition, and 3% were living with diseases. So I'll share some stories. So at that point, I'm a venture capitalist in medicine and health and wellness. I was president of the board of Harvey Medical Center in the middle of training for Ironman Canada. And I had done this experiment about the past four months where I'd gone on a paleo diet because I thought the paleo triathletes seemed to be faster. And I'll have brilliant blood markers with this paleo diet and I embraced it wholeheartedly. And so I sort of said to Lee, my co-founder, yeah, I'm gonna be the healthiest person in this study. <laughs> and so my data comes back and the first thing my coach says is you're pre-diabetic. And I'm like, oh, there's been a data switch. Like, that could not be me. (laughs) And so she helps me understand I have genetic variants where I actually cannot process a paleo diet. I need rich, dense, complex carbohydrates in every single meal to normalize my blood sugar levels. So how counterintuitive is that? It's a paleo made me pre-diabetic with very high inflammation markers. 
So what she then helped me understand is that of the 108 people, I had the highest mercury level of anyone in the study, to the point where, in the future, I like to say, it was going to impact my neurological functions. And so think about it. I get a physical every year. You know, I'm actively engaged. No one's ever told me this. So once again, the value of a coach, registered dietitian, backed up by a clinical team, backed up by a physician. So she says, you have variants that about 20% of the population have where you do not process toxins as well as some people. So that might be the reason for your buildup. Do you eat a lot of tuna sushi? I'm like, no, I'm a salmon guy. Uh, and so further exploration, well, how old are you? And I was 56 at the time. Do you have a lot of old fillings? And for about a decade, my dentist has said, you know, you should get these fillings replaced. And I'm like, yeah, next year, next year. <laughs> um, and so these old amalgam fillings had been leaching mercury uh, into my body because I have these variants where I don't process toxins as well. Some people, they built up. And so all of a sudden, I've got insights and reason to get these fillings replaced. Had them all replaced, and it took my body about a year to normalize my mercury levels. On the more extreme side, um, and one of the first things the coach does is says, why are you here? You know, what's being healthy look like? What do you want to be doing in five years? What do you want to be doing in 10 years? So this individual shared he and his wife passionate about hiking. They live to hike. And he was starting to have cartilage issues in his ankle. And his physician sort of like, mm, early 60s, there, there, that stuff happens. And so we do the genetic profile. And he's got a predisposition for hemochromatosis, which is the body doesn't process iron. And so then we, on our standard panel, look at ferritin levels, which is an indication of iron, highly elevated. Now, we're a wellness company, so we don't treat, we don't diagnose, we don't prescribe. So we say, take this data and go have a conversation with your physician. We actually got a thank you note from the physician because he said, I didn't have access to genetic information, and so I wouldn't have thought to look at the ferritin levels. And the great news is that when you catch hemochromatosis early, you just have to donate blood on a regular basis, and that normalizes the iron level. So we did the study of 108 people, uh, dramatically improved. I mean, all of them said, you know, you materially improved my wellness. And so we decided to launch a startup. Uh, and so we launched Aravel two years ago last July. And as a startup, uh, initially we raised $36 million, have raised about another 15, so have raised about 50 million to date. And like every good scarred up, uh, lots of scar tissue and lots of successes. But what we're most passionate about is we're at about 4,000 individuals now have gone through the flagship program. And every individual that signs up, um, they get an email from me with my cell phone number and my email address. And so I talk to lots and lots of people who go through the program and just so passionate because of the impact that these individuals on this journey of what they're doing to change their lives. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Perfectly. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, so let's spin a little bit into, the, into this kind of very nascent field of the industry. For example, I did like the 23andMe test, mm -hmm. you know, like, so I guess 23andMe launched before mm -hmm. Arvel, right? But with a different kind of niche, providing you more of introspection of what are your genetical predisposition for different diseases, what's your ancestry and everything else. And I think that they did it amazingly well, right? Great interface, great data analysis. And then somewhere in the middle, they didn't accelerate the trend to get from that point to a full kind of recommendation system, right? So based on the data, based on, you know, like collecting kind of different signals like your blood test, saliva tests, um, and, and basically, you know, like I believe that you entered into that space uh, very efficiently. But I see, you know, like other kind of startups kind of getting into the area. So how do you fill that whole space? Even it's more nascent now here, mm -hmm. a couple of players. How do you see that whole space going? So uh, as an investor, I met with Anne, the founder of 23andMe, and very thankful for what she's done because she spent hundreds of millions of dollars creating a brand. And it's interesting because both 23andMe and Ancestry, what they've done is they've raised consumer awareness to think, OK, genetics, I can learn my ancestry, and that's kind of fun. You know? And for $99, what the heck, it's a transactional purchase. And so from a general consumer awareness, it's sort of either people are thinking, I need to know about my genetics for a disease state, or let's find out where I'm from. And I think Anne's done a good job there. What's interesting, obviously, is that the data she has is from a SNP panel. It's a relatively limited amount of genetic information, and it's one data set, one moment in time. And so when we looked at that, I've yet to meet a person who went through 23andMe and said, oh, it changed my life. I'm much healthier because of what I learned. And so what we've been very focused on is we're even really clear with our members, genes are not your destiny. 
and we actually don't even coach to genetic variants. We're coaching to the clinical analytes, but what we're doing is looking at the variants to help us understand why we might be seeing what we see in the blood data. And so first distinction is we're a system, genetics, data, gut microbiome, saliva, trying to look at you as a system because people have signals from different parts. Second, we refresh people's blood every six months because it's the change in the analytes, the change in the data are, are we moving you from red to green? And I'm in year three of the program, and I'm now just turning my attention to my cortisol level uh, because I had to get the diabetes in check. Then I had to get the cortisol work in check. And so, and what's important, we organize these five health dimensions. So, you know, diabetes risk, heart health, inflammation, optimal nutrition. For each of you in the room, they would be stacked, ranked based on what we see going on in your blood. Then within each health dimension, the analytes would be stacked, ranked to what you need to work on. Um, what you need to watch and what is optimal. And what's great about that is it's dynamic. But then let's say you go to heart health, we're gonna show you genetic variants that impact some of the lifestyle decisions you need to make. So for example, we look at LDL. And they'll geek out a little bit here. So our scientists have curated over a thousand genetic variants related to LDL. Because what's interesting is a single genetic variant is rare in of itself and has limited impact. But you put a thousand genetic variants together, we create algorithms, we look at the weighting, uh, some are positive, some are negative. And now we've done studies, and so it's been fascinating that for LDL, the bad cholesterol. We put roughly, at that point, we had 3,000 members into five quintiles and came up with a genetic predisposition for having high LDL, and everyone mapped beautifully to their genetic predisposition unless they were on a statin. So then how do we use that information to coach? So let's say you come in and you have a brilliant genetic predisposition and you have really high LDL. The coach knows we're gonna be able to give some interesting lifestyle recommendations that are actually going to impact that. Where on the flip side, I genetically am screwed from an LDL perspective. I eat right, I exercise, I'm in category five, and genetically that's where I'm gonna be. And so my coach says, mm, make sure you're talking to your physician about a calcium scan of your heart, maybe a carotid artery to sort of see, are you building up? So that's where the genetics, once again, can bring to life to sort of give visions of, um, when we're looking at all these analytes, what should we be looking for? Does that answer the yeah. question? Yeah. yeah, yeah, So having, you know, like to build up a little bit on what you said, um, I wanna kind of venture into the baseline, all the baseline studies, right? Um, basically, what's a baseline for health for every individual on, on many of the tests that, that, that you're providing, right? For example, the blood markers, they have like a categories for, you know, like decades that, okay, you know, like if you're in this, category that everything's fine, right? But that vary on an individual for individual basis, right? And then fine grain, you, you, you go more into the depth of every scale, then you can have like a more kind of fine grade outcome for every individual based on the differences into the genome and, and everything else, right? And, uh, and many of the advices, basically all of the advices in the classical kind of health industry, they relies on those standardized measurements that are same for, for, for everybody, right? So are you guys thinking more about that field, going more in depth? So <clears throat> right now, the, the message is primarily mm -hmm. optimize wellness. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is to look at genetic predisposition, both for wellness and for disease. And so we're now launching some clinical trials. So I'll give you one example. Uh, our co-founder, Dr. Lee Hood, believes that Alzheimer's is probably actually eight to 10 different diseases. And so if you go in and understand someone's genetic predisposition, well, it could be then the omic that's triggered the disease, say it's a protein or a metabolite or a clinical lab or even something in your gut, if you understood the genetic predisposition, for different individuals then, you'd actually look at different omics to say, is the disease triggered? And if it's triggered, what would be the right, could be some, in some cases pharmaceutical solution, what would be the right lifestyle recommendation to actually slow down or reverse the transition into the disease state? So in this first one we're launching with Alzheimer's, we're taking 200 individuals that have early cognitive decline. So, and first thing we're doing is going in and creating these dense dynamic data clouds to understand what's unique about them genetically. 
then we were on, if you're not in science, you may not know this publication called Nature Biotechnology, but it's considered, if not the first, the second most premier scientific journal in the world. It's a peer-reviewed journal. So we submitted a paper on the first 108 individuals. And what our scientists did is that we came up with a correlation network where we looked at someone's genetic predisposition, and then we found what were the signals to that genetic predisposition to metabolites, proteomics, clinical labs, gut microbiome. And for this paper, the scientists just pulled out 32 different signals. Of the 32 signals that we identified, the correlations, turned out two were already drugs in market. One's a drug in clinical trial. And the other 29, there was no paper or research we could find. Now, what's important about that is that many of you in this room right now may have a disease that started in your body. And you may not have symptoms for a year, and in some cases, for a decade. But when you finally have symptoms, that's when you're going to show up and present yourself to the healthcare system. Well, imagine if we understood your genetic predisposition and we understood which omic is unique to you that we should be tracking if there's something that's relatively high risk, and starting to do that at a very low cost. So here's an example. An individual been in our program for two years, very sadly shared with her coach that she'd been diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. And so stage four pancreatic cancer tends to be fatal because it's stage four because it's asymptomatic, because it's going through its whole journey. So we biobank blood from every single blood draw, which we do every six months. So with the permission of the individual, we went back and we analyzed the prior uh, four blood draws over two years and did a really extensive proteomic panel. Turns out there's a protein that was completely out of range from the other 3,000 individuals for this individual, completely out of range. And she was the only outlier. As we did research on that protein, it turns out it's linked to the function of the pancreas. So imagine if we understood genetic predisposition for pancreatic cancer, not hard to do. Uh, then think if we actually can identify what is the omic, you know, a protein metabolite that says the disease has triggered, started its journey, and knew to intercept it long before real damage is done. Another example, individual comes in, she has a protein that in our first interaction with her is materially out of range. So we work with independent third-party physician, he called her, said, you need to go see your physician. She's like, well, I had the flu during the blood draw. And he said, okay, well, that could have been it. Six months later, he's still out of range. So once again, physician referral says she's going to do it. Doesn't do it. Six months later, now we're 18 months in, we're like, our chief translational science officer called her and said, we don't know this is serious, but you really want to go have a conversation. Turns out she had leukemia. Uh, and so once again, it's interesting now as our company is getting older to look at these transitions from wellness to disease. And of course, the big idea here is to avoid the transition to diseases because of where the science is. And so that's part of what we're doing. Another example would be, because we look at gut microbiome, which is so nascent, I mean, it's very nascent. And what's interesting is that there's companies launching you know, that are only looking at the gut. And we have a number of individuals that are experts in this. So as we look at the bacteria in someone's gut, there's certain types of bacteria that if you're over-indexed on TMAO, if you eat red meat, in both the short term and the long term, you're going to do meaningful cardiovascular damage to your system. So we now give everyone a TMAO score to say, your TMO is highly elevated. You, on the whole, want to avoid red meat, or we need to figure out how to drive better diversity in your gut if you're passionate about eating red meat. So there's a couple, few examples. Wow. That's impressive. So this is what I'm thinking, right? Um, how do you see the future going into this field, right? I'm like, one. We here at Google, I mean, like, you know that we live on the days on real-time data, right? That keeps kind of coming 100% of the time. And we process that and we build systems to, to process that, right? Here, you know, like, uh, in the field, you know, like it's, it seems it's very nascent, right? You're taking the blood once per six months, right? The microbiome test, and once per year, then you do a saliva test once per year as well, right? And then the DNA probably sampling gets fixed because it's your code and you don't need to repeat that. But then, you know, like, how do you see, you know, like, do you see kind of any kind of future investments going into the field to make this kind of more kind of real time? Now it's hard, right? It's hard to kind of inject a chip and get your blood test, you know, through a Wi-Fi real time transmitted so every day you can track that or get your microbiome analyzed every day. Uh, but do you see that the future going there? 
So <clears throat> three things. Uh, one, when we did our initial study uh, two and a half years ago, we were spending $10,000 per individual on the assays because we were both we both the number of assays and the frequency of the assays, we didn't know where the signal was going to be coming from. So for two years, we burned through a lot of venture capital uh, where we were doing all of this data. We've now reduced the assay cost down to roughly $1,200, and we're giving all of the exact same information. And so one of the first things to be thinking about is, of course, you've all heard about Moore's Law related to genetics. I know when Lee did the first, micro, first whole genome sequence, God knows how much what it was. We were spending roughly $1,400 on whole genome sequence, and now we're doing a SNP panel because we're getting the same data. You know, so in two years, a company went from spending roughly $1,500 to $175 on genetics, same data. Second thing that we did is that as we now, with these first 3,000 individuals, every six months we were doing the full panel of omics. Well, now we know if certain omics are in the green, they're not going to move into the yellow or red within six months. So we do what's called reflexive testing at a six-month mark, full testing. Mm -hmm. So what we've got to do is get the cost down. You know, for the first offering of roughly 70 days for all the blood and all the genetics right now, it's $999. A lot of people, that's too much money, and our goal is to democratize this. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it was so sad to follow what happened at Theranos because if microfluidics would have worked, that would have been a brilliant way to make it A, much easier, yes. and B, much more affordable. But we do believe technology cost and the assay cost will be coming down. So that's job mm -hmm. one. Job two, healthcare is basically a giant ocean liner, and it's very slow to change. But what's been interesting in my 14 years as a trustee is that when I first joined the board, you know, our KPIs were all around billing codes, where we had to bill for the pill, the device, the hour. We're now in volume-based pricing. And so if you show up and you have an event and you're coded for that event, I show up and have the same event and I'm coded for that same event. You stay three days, I stay two weeks. We're going to make money on you. We're going to lose a boatload of money on me. And so the primary KPI right now in the healthcare system is length of stay because it has very perverse motivations, and of course, it's all billing codes. And there's very few billing codes for wellness, but there's starting to be some interesting signals. So the Boeing Corporation, two years ago, issued an ACO contract where they said, here's 20,000 lives. You major healthcare systems can bid to take care of these 20,000 individuals, but oh, by the way, it's a fixed price contract, so you're going to take care of them and not raise your rates for five years. And historically, we raised our rate every year 12 to 15 16%. So we bid on it, we being the University of Washington healthcare system, the Providence St. Joseph healthcare system bid on it, and off we go. Three years in, Providence pulled out because they couldn't figure it out. And we at the University of Washington system, it's the first time in the boardroom I hear, like, okay, how are we going to keep these people healthy? You know, so actually trying to think about not optimizing treating illnesses, but actually keeping people healthy. So there's going to be some change there. There's going to have to be some change. There's three drivers of human health. Three drivers of human health. Any sense of what they'd be? Help me out here. Exercise and rest. Exercise, rest, great. Any diet. other diet? Yes. Well, you're generally spot on. So three drivers. In the course of your lifetime, 30% of your health is determined by genetics. 60% behavior, lifestyle, environment. 10% the healthcare system. And so think how crazy it is that we're devoting 18% of our GDP to the tiniest slice. Now go one level deeper. So what's the primary tool physicians have? Pharmaceuticals, right? So there are studies that indicate of the top 10 grossing drugs in the United States today, the top 10 grossing, the most effective helps one out of four people that take the drug. The least effective helps one out of 24. So think of the billions that we're giving people these pills that are actually not helping, in many cases hurting, especially when there's combinations of them, because that is where that science is to date. And so we're in conversations with some pharmaceuticals right now. One example, so um, non-small cell lung cancer, uh, late stage. Uh, there's an immun immuno immunotherapy that's binary, either it works or it doesn't work. If it works, you live, if it doesn't work, you die. Uh, and they don't know why. And so that pharmaceutical company has come to us and said, we want to put 200 people that have this disease, late stage, we want you, Aravel, to create these dense dynamic data clouds for these individuals so we can understand, is there a genetic profile that this drug actually works or doesn't work? And then is there an interesting omic uh, that we could identify also that would help us understand that. So 
N of one data has the potential to make both the healthcare system much more effective and clearly pharmaceuticals. I think I got a tangent there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so let's go more, a little bit more into okay. that, into, into this area. So I'm observing, for example, what Craig Venter is doing with the Human Longevity yes. Institute and, and, and that initiative as well. Um, so it seems that they, you know, like they're doing, you know, like slightly similar ap approach to what you have, but on top of that, implementing with the detailed, most advanced MRI scans mm -hmm. and all that stuff. So where do you see from the data points that you're collecting overall today, what are you missing? What are the big things? Is that the MRI is something else? It's like more real-time data. How, how do you see the field growing one, two years from now, right? So um, Craig Ventners has the company called Human Longevity Institute, and its price point is roughly $25,000. Uh, and you go to San Diego, and it's cool and it's sexy, but we've had a lot of people go through HLI and a lot of people go through Aravel. And what they say the distinction is is that you assign a coach I talk to my coach, some people every day, texting and apping with it, and that coach is taking that complex data and translating it into actionable recommendation based on what I'm willing to do and what I want to do. So that's distinction one from a market perspective. On the assay side, um, Lee Hood and his scientist at the Institute of Assistance Biology continue to have a lot of assays that they want us to do. And so for participants, we actually do a couple discovery assays where we can't share the data back because they're not yet from CLIA approved labs and it's not necessarily actionable. But behind the scenes, in addition to the blood, saliva, gut microbiome, <clears throat> we're looking at proteomics and metabolites. And that's where there's some really interesting signals of when we look at these correlations of genetic risk, then understanding what omic is that linked to. And so, as I shared for the example of the person that had um, pancreatic cancer or the person who had leukemia, that was by looking at proteomics and metabolites. And we continue to do discovery work, but part of it is a nascent startup that's funded by venture capital is that always trying to figure out that balance of where to make those investments. But some of our partners now are coming to us and saying, okay, I'd like to discover it. So back to Providence St. Joseph. They have put a 1,000 of their employees into Aravel for three years, and they're doing a clinical trial where they're saying, okay, we want to be a healthcare system that actually keeps people well. And so we're putting a 1,000 of our employees in to learn what is the impact of scientific wellness in terms of reducing healthcare claims cost, improving health overall. Uh, another example would be Colgate. So I didn't appreciate half of the world's population uses a Colgate product for oral care. Uh, and so they have numerous brands. So they heard about Lee Hood, they heard about Aravel, P4 Medicine, and came to us and said, the future of oral care is going to be some degree N of 1. And their thesis is there's about five meaningful different types of oral microbiome. And based on each of you in the room maybe falling into one of these five categories, they are developing tooth care or oral care that would be much more impactful for you based on your unique microbiome. And so we're now involved in a clinical trial with them to understand how would we look at the overall system of an individual and determine what is the right oral care. So starting to be a lot of N of one experiments to understand we're unique and of course we're all treated exactly the same. All right, cool. Um, so, you know, like, I'm very optimistic about your field, right? And I think that you're Thank you, against, the, <laughs> against taking 18% of our, you know, like GDP and repurposing that on the long run, if successful, to something much more bigger for, for everybody that lives in this country and hopefully in the world, right? Yes. Um, so let's go kind of one, one step uh, beyond, right? Um, you know, like your personal thoughts on, you know, like all the initiatives by Aubrey de Grey on the whole kind of longevity, where are the lines, where are the borders? Let's say, you know, like I'm an Arvel customer, I follow all of your recommendations, advices, um, yeah, I'm in a perfect health, you know, like where is the frontier beyond that? Tell me. So the Aubrey de Grey is the guy that leads the Longevity yes. Institute and it's one of the most vocal, uh, you know, like exponents of basically solving every disease, cardiovascular, Alzheimer's, that, you know, the major cancer, right, the mm -hmm. major causes of that. And then beyond that, you know, like uh, addressing like the senescence issues in the body and then, you know, like having a theory that at some time point, you know, like it's not 120 years the maximum age of humans, but mm -hmm. it can be ex extended in, you know, for who knows how long, right? So, so your thoughts into that? 
Well, I'm, so, I'm going to give you, I think, an answer that's not going to fit in. So mm -hmm. what we aspire to do is help people optimize their wellness and avoid disease for a life filled with joyful moments. And actually what we do is every week in our team meetings, coaches get up and share stories from individuals in terms of what they're actually doing. And the first thing a coach is going to do is say, why are you here? You know, what's it mean to be healthy? Why do you want to be healthy? And of course, what's interesting is most people actually don't even think about that. You know, or have you thought about what you want to look like in 20 years and what you want to be doing? Excellent. But not a lot of people have. And so what we aspire to do at Aravel is help people live full, joyful, you know, robust lives where you're not focused on being ill and necessarily being well. But we're actually, especially me, I'm not actually thinking that living forever is necessarily a goal or an aspiration. And so we have a little bit of a joke internally where right now, if you get to 100 and you're healthy and happy, you tend to die relatively quickly. And so our goal is to get you to 100, have you leave full, rich lives, and then you're on your own and you'll probably have a system failure and go quickly. And so okay. the, um, we actually don't spend a lot of time thinking about beyond the 100 phase. Okay, okay. I'm just going one step further. Once you, yeah, once I, you solve that, that'll reality, be the next startup. The, the next startup. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay. Like the theory of aging is itself. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. But, but also, what's so interesting about that is that, once again, all of us have these different end of one. So, another story with Alzheimer's. So we've taken our roughly 4,000 clients now, we've created polygenic risk profiles of their likelihood to have Alzheimer's. And now we're diving in and saying, okay, what's unique? And so we put them into five quintiles again. And so the fifth quintile, the people at highest risk, started to say, what's unique about these individuals? Well, it turns out the typical person as they age, the uh, amyloids in your brain start to increase. And so there's an indication that that actually might be a protective function that helps preserve cognitive function. So for quintile number five at highest risk, this group, as they're aging, their amyloids aren't increasing. So, you know, once again, how interesting is that when you think about these major chronic disease states that as we're all living longer, what is the implication of what we need to be looking at to make sure we are living healthy lives as we age? Okay. So I have like one more question and then we'll give it to the audience. Okay. So basically on, on scaling things, I mean like you have like an interesting model with kind of personal coaches and everything else. Um, is it scalable, right? So basically I think, you know, like all of us in this room are kind of fine tuned to building, you know, like artificial intelligence systems or at least observing them into our real lives and basically automating everything that we can. So, and to scale, right? To build kind of worldwide, you know, like infrastructure and systems yes. across billions of users, right? Can you scale that model? So the back end of how we think about scaling is that a lot of what your company's been extraordinary at. And so when we initially launched, the reason I went rated free and clear is that they had scaled within five years from serving 40,000 individuals a year to 400,000 individuals a year <laughs> with a comparable coaching program. But of course, 400,000 is not very many. So when we initially launched the company, for every coaching call, the clinical team spent roughly two hours preparing chart notes because we had data coming from 14 different labs giving the chart notes to the coach, and then the coach coming up with recommendations. So two hours for roughly a 45 minute call, two hours of prep and post. Right now the prep and post is down to about 20 minutes. And the way we've been able to do that is that we have machine learning that is tracking every single recommendation that the clinical team's making. So now as the data's coming in, about 70% of the recommendations are automated. And so it's the exception rules that are going back out to the clinical team. And our goal by the end of Q1 is to get recommendations roughly at 95% automated. Now the control obviously is that the dietitian is licensed is looking at that data and saying, does that make sense? Second thing is that uh, free and clear, their model is basically their coaches, registered dietitians, work from home across the United States. Uh, and so we see it to be a really interesting opportunity in terms of scaling that aspect. Third is leveraging technology to amplify the relationship. So right now, the individuals that are using the Aravel app, on average, are checking in on the app 14 times a day. And it's the app and the bot that's extending the relationship. So as I said, I'm working on sleep because like every startup CEO, I believe sleep is not required. And so I have a goal right now with my coach where I'm going to quit working by 10 and I'm going to go to bed by 11. So my phone at 10, the Airville app pops up and it says swipe right if you're going to quit working. And then at 11 o'clock it pops up and it says you know, swipe right if you're going to go to bed. 
Well, I often don't swipe. <laughs> but she sees my Fitbit data on my dashboard because it's all synced together. And so she, you know, I got a text from her after I'd been on the road for about a week like, oh, how's that going? Five hours a night of sleep, five days in a row. I bet you're really being a great CEO, my goal, and your Ironman performance is probably right on track, isn't it, Clayton? You know, and so how does technology and bots leverage these objectives? So there's big opportunities there. And then finally, in the back end right now, we're building the Aravel affiliate network. And the objective of the Aravel affiliate network is we already have physician groups and hospitals coming to us and saying, okay, we want to roll this out through our panels and our patients. And what can be interesting about that is also a potential reduction and COGS because of the thousand dollars in assays right now, none of it's reimbursed. And so, but it looks like as we're talking to these physician groups, they might be able to get reimbursed anywhere from $250 to $300. And so, one, it's about technology automating the recommendations. Uh, two, using technology to extend and enhance the coaching relationship, not to replace it. And then a work from home model and then leveraging other systems. See. But we spend a lot of time thinking about it. Yeah, cool, cool. Second question is, uh, like you said, your company is just two years old. Yes. And I would say that's the like earliest age for startup. Uh, so what's your end goal? Like, what's your vision where you want to be? So three, three end goals. One, the democratization of wellness. And so our objective, ultimately, <coughs> is that the wellness industry will dwarf the sick care industry. And so this category that we're going to launch, not just by ourselves, but with a lot of partners, that there will be more money putting into staying well and optimizing wellness than there'll be in treating symptoms, and that it'll be very affordable to people from all walks of life. Thank you. Well, one produce that much money as being sick, right? <laughs> so how, how do you manage to tackle that? So tell me one more time, being well? Being well, like if you're well, insurance won't pay for, for anything, right? There is no point for the insurance. For, how, how do you, I guess in other words, how do you democratize this wellness program and how do you sell it? Like insurances are basically destined to be sick. There are many entities in the industry benefiting of somebody being sick. Today, exactly. Right? So the perverse incentives, financial incentives are our current system. And so it, one thing that will be interesting and I think will start to happen is much like the example of the Boeing ACO I gave you, the state of Washington has issued an ACO, so we're going to have to change the incentive of healthcare systems. And what's happening right now is we're migrating from volume-based care, which is where we're at right now, to value-based care. And we're at the earliest stages of that, but I actually believe that is where we're going to go. And so when I'm out talking to healthcare systems and to pharmaceutical companies, I say, look at your outcomes. Congress alone is not going to continue to put up with this. We all know that the healthcare system today is broken. Way too much money is going in. The challenge is, is that it's so slow to change that, you know, as a startup, you're always trying to figure out, am I cutting edge or am I bleeding edge? And so we've got to figure out how to get the right partnerships. Since that's why I was so excited that Providence St. Joseph said, we're putting 1,000 employees in because we actually want to change the system. Three weeks ago, Spectrum Healthcare System, Grand Rapids, Michigan. So they invited me in to be the keynote speaker at their annual meeting. So 300 people in the room, all their board members, their CEOs, um, and you know, I'm basically giving my talk saying, you're the 10%, but you're taking 18% of the GDP. What's wrong with that? You, the physician, spent 17 minutes, 17 minutes. You can't help those folks in 17 minutes. Let's look at the drugs you're giving. After I gave that talk, which was somewhat provocative, you know, they immediately said, we want to form a joint venture with you. Uh, we want to figure out how to introduce Aravel to keep some body of individuals safe. So we're definitely plowing early ground there. And I don't, I don't have a clear path, and so the question is, Everything in life, especially if you look at business, it's gradually, gradually, then suddenly. And when the suddenly happen, a transformation takes place. And you know, Seattle, we've driven a lot of them. So think of real estate. So I was president COO of um, Market Leader. And so you know, at Market Leader, what we were doing is trying to give people the keys to the multiple listing service. You know, so my mom's been a realtor forever, and I'm old. So you know, it used to be in the old days, you couldn't buy or sell a house without a realtor, because they had the keys to the MLS system. So they had all the data. And so Zillow came along, opened up the keys, and now we have companies like Redfin. And we as consumers, when we buy and sell, we go and have a conversation with our realtor, which is very different than we did before they had data. You know, same thing with travel agents. Back in the day, if you wanted to find the least expensive travel uh, airline ticket, you had to go to the travel agent because they had all the data. And so what's interesting about Aravel is we're making 
our participants much more sophisticated um, understand individuals understanding their data. So a lot of them go and have conversations with their physician, which are much better educated conversations. Uh, and so we believe also that one, there's going to be changes by payers. Two, consumers are going to demand a different level of engagement and expectation. And then three, as the prices come down and we figure out how to have conversations with people, you know, much like 23andMe, people are curious. The top selling item on Amazon Prime Day, top selling item, 23andMe. And so think about that. You know, consumers now, as I said at the start, they're interested in uh, genetics related to ancestry. We've got to get that bridge now. Genetics about staying well. So that's how we think about it. I'm optimistic. Sorry, I actually had one question that was related to all this, which is that yes. um, do you know how many like health dollars that are moving towards like um, flexible spending accounts? Because I intuitively feel like, I don't know, Google certainly told all of our employees, you're probably going to be better covered under our flexible spending accounts than a lot of uh, than uh, like the, the GHIP, the um, uh, health investment plan, than you will be under most of the uh, like PPO or whatever it was. Right. Um, for most cases, just you end up like having uh, less out-of-pocket expenses over the course of a year. And uh, I sort of wonder if that's the case that there are more uh, health spending dollars that are moving to people that have that the ability to make the decision. Um, is that is that is that the case? In, or intuitively, I think you're right. I don't have that data. Okay. Uh, a quick example there, Intuit. So Intuit uh, decided to launch Arabelle across their organization. And the first thing they did is say, okay, we're going to let 200 individuals of Intuit enroll in the program. Oh, by the way, we Intuit have paid our employees to participate in wellness programs. We're going to charge them $1,000 for Arabelle. And so we're like, hmm, great. So we drop onto the Intuit campus. Uh, we're there for 48 hours. And there was only 200 slots. When registration opened, an hour and 10 minutes later, all 200 were taken. And Intuit had objectives around BMI, you know, weight. They had objectives around diabetes. And so within six months, we had exceeded both of those metrics by 50%. So then they said, OK, we want to enroll another 200. And now they're rolling out throughout their whole company. Now what Intuit does is they put a $1,000 a year into their employees' HSA account. And so they now can use that money to pay for the Aravel program. So we see more and more where companies are funding flexible spending accounts, health savings accounts for people to deploy against wellness offerings. Hey, Clayton, thanks again for joining us today. Of course. Uh, question, would love to hear your point of view on the, the data, whether it's with Aravel or uh, another company being used for means that aren't consistent with your mission, because I totally agree with the mission, um, but think uh, in insurance companies using that for pre-existing conditions and, and the like. So my old boss, Congresswoman Louise Slaughter, actually passed the GINA legislation. And the GINA legislation pr prohibits discrimination based on employment and health care doesn't prohibit discrimination based on long-term disability and life insurance. So interesting. Our philosophy is, is that you own your data, and we will not share your data with anyone. And the first thing that happens is that when your data comes in, it's all de-identified from any personal health information. So even if our data sets get hacked on the research side, it's been stripped of all identifiable information. And even these relationships we have with employers like Intuit or Colgate or Providence St. Joseph, we say you can't get access to your employees' data. And so there has to be a bright line because one, if there wasn't, people wouldn't have confidence about coming in. Uh, two, you know, part of what keeps me up at night is data security because we've got some of the most prominent individuals in the country, both business leaders and elected officials in our program, and they said, you know, if, you're, if my data gets out, it would tank my stock price. Uh, and so not only would it be a company killing event, but we have eight values, and one of our values is trust, another value is privacy. Um, that said, you know, bad stuff happens. And so, you know, as a small company with only 175 employees, we have three on data security. And a team, we hire outside firms that come in and try to hack us down to where they'll call into the customer care line and say, oh, this is Clayton. I need so-and-so's information. And so we do a lot of things where we're trying to be focused on protecting that. Does that answer the question? Yeah, so just to be clear, insurance can't not use They don't have access to it. Now, but to be clear, the GINA legislation 
Well, two things that we're doing right now. Right now, because we are a health and wellness company, we're only giving you genetic information related to health and wellness. So we're not giving you information about BRCA, we're not giving you information about Alzheimer's, we're not giving you information about any of those highly um, impactful disease states. So we're not even giving you information. The gene legislation uh, for life insurance or for long-term disability, some insurance companies will say, okay, do you have this information? And you know, there's a, they're asking you to disclose. Uh, we're not engaged, you would not get that information from us uh, because A, we haven't disclosed it to you. Now the future um, is gonna be interesting and what I would say is that you know, the current FDA is being more thoughtful about understanding that genetic information should be given to individuals and they should own their own data. So there's been some vast transformations there. Yeah, so, I think uh, I'll probably answer my question. So um, I feel the uh, healthcare industry is a highly regulated industry and uh, I, my only question is just want to, to comment on the uh, FDA regulations, for example, at one point, FDA prohibits uh, companies that report uh, relations with cancer with genie. And then at one point, maybe <coughs> it got, this ban got lifted. And uh, how to, from your point of view, how to um, um, overcome these challenges? So the FDA is interesting. As I said, I worked in Congress for a number of years. and. The FDA is a bit of a black box because there's not like this playbook that says, okay, this is, this is what's happening and things are evolving so quickly and their positions are evolving, especially with the new administration. And so what we decided to do out of the gate as a business is to embrace the regulatory practice. So the first thing that happens when an individual signs up in every state we operate, we have an independent third party physician and that physician orders all the clinical labs. The clinical labs all are CLIA approved labs. And then we have a licensed professional dietitian, licensed in the state where you live, coaching you on what she or he's allowed to practice. So we made a business decision out of the gate to embrace the regulatory environment so we wouldn't have the 23andMe experience. We also, because we're trying to change people's lives, we believe it's important to have the right professionals engaged in the conversation. On the flip side, um, like I'm friends with Senator Patty Murray and Maria Cantwell, and Patty Murray is the ranking Democrat on the Senate and Health Human Services Committee. So we've been going in and having conversations with her and her team. And she actually hired a number of former FDA staffers to try to help us sort of figure out how do we have thoughtful conversations with the FDA on saying, let's look at the fact that we are scientific data. Let's look at the fact that there's consumers that take this information and use it in a very powerful way. And once again, thank you to 23andMe for being a leader in this space. And they went through and have now had a number of genetic variants approved where the FDA has looked at how they present that information. The FDA has reviewed it and said, okay, that is fine to give that information directly to a consumer. The FDA, as you know, originally was concerned because there weren't licensed professionals involved. You know, there weren't physicians reviewing it, there weren't dietitians, and so we've taken a different business model to embrace the current regulatory environment and completely play by the rules. But it is challenging, like the state of New York, the state of New York is the only state that we cannot operate in, and we're going through their regulatory process, it's gonna cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars and take about a year. Uh, and think about that, 49 other states, we completely embrace their regulatory environment. New York is unique in terms of the amount of money we have to spend and the process. And so there are some legacy states that are challenged, but we love the state of New York in case you're watching. Yeah. <laughs> is there a last yeah, I, I fun think that conversation? We are right on time. So I would really like to thank Clayton for coming here today to talk to us and I hope everybody enjoyed the talk. I really loved all your questions. I've got brochures and business cards over there if you want more information. And thank you so much. Thank yeah. you for being a member and loved your questions. Um, great to have the conversation with you. Thank you. Cool. Your questions were great. Thank you. Yeah.